Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. Okay, my clock says it's 11 o'clock, so let's get started. Um, my name is Thomas Bowles. I'm the Ag Extension Agent here in Prince William County. Today's class is on container gardening with Jeff Zimmerman, who is a Master Gardener volunteer. I think we're all ready for you to go. Again, ladies and gentlemen, questions in the chat box, please. And I will mute myself and let Jeff take over. All right, and I assume my screen is still showing. It's claims it is. Um, hello, I'm Jeff Zimmerman. Uh, I've been a master gardener for nine years now, I think. Uh, and I'm an avid container gardener. Uh, started quite a long time ago, container gardening. I have anywhere generally between 70 and 85 or so containers containing vegetables and flowers and various plants and trees in my yard at any given time. I did a quick count as I was driving back home from work today to give this of how many I have just sitting out now. And it's, it's pretty low right now. We're not quite at 50, so still have a number left to populate. But um, I, I do love container gardening, perhaps a little bit too much. Um, always says we can't even leave the house anymore because we have to find somebody who's going to be dedicated enough to come water all of my, uh, my plants. Um, so today we're going to talk about container gardening. And these are just a few of my containers. I do like to, to repurpose. Um, and uh, at the top of this, this slide are some of the reasons that I enjoy it. You know, being able to be creative, to repurpose, convenience, flexibility, versatility. And at the bottom is one of my, my favorite quotes. And building a successful container garden is no more complicated than choosing a container, filling it with media, and planting it with plants. You can almost get anything to grow. There's a few things that you should understand before you uh, you go out and do it. So why container gardening? Well, it's practical and efficient growing technique. You're in charge of your environment from where you put the, the pot, um, where you want it. I have a lot of things that actually I put up earlier um, before the freeze, knowing that when we had a freeze, I'd have to bring them back in. I had put out small pots and where it was able to, to uh, easily bring them back into the garage for the evening. Um, you're flexible, um, works just about any environment, inside and outside. I've, I've tried to reduce how many I drag in and out every year. Um, I think I'm down to three now, um, two succulents and a calamondin tree, which I take in and out at the uh, beginning, and, uh, beginning of uh, fall and the beginning of spring. Um, it allows for easy organic gardening. Uh, I have a very large vegetable garden as well, for which I'm constantly fighting pests, rotating crops, doing this and that. With containers, though, you get to start over every single year from where you, you know, fresh. Media, the container is easy to clean out. So you don't have those year-to-year -year pests as often as you would in a, uh, in a larger garden. Accommodate seasonal change. I like differences between the, the, the um, spring and the fall. I, I often uh, have bulbs which, which come up in the spring in my containers. I'll put those those in the garden later on. Um, I, I enjoy, enjoy being able to uh, garden through the seasons. Um, you can grow tropical plants. Like I said, I have a calamondin tree. They're little tiny oranges, well, very tart. Uh, we make cakes out of them. Um, we take that in and out every year. It's in my basement near a window right now, and uh, I will take it out for the, uh, the summer season. Um, it really enjoys it. I get a lot of growth then. It definitely doesn't enjoy it as much in the uh, in this time of the year. It's perfect for confined and small spaces um, and for screening. I had set up a whole series of, of plants for my daughter when she was in the townhouse in Centerville, just as a screen on her deck from her, her one next door neighbor. Provides a little bit of privacy, and she still had plenty of room on her deck to uh, to barbecue and you know eat out and so forth. 
it's fairly inexpensive to get started. There's not a lot of tools that are required. It's very HOA friendly, which is another big advantage. And it allows you to express your creativity. Um, a number of uh, years ago, I was reading an article about one of the local large nurseries and how over the years in Northern Virginia, their plant selections have slowly changed as our area has become more dense and more people have wanted to grow in containers and indeed, when you go to any, any place that sells a good deal of plants, you see a wide variety of plants that are really just made, uh, or not made, but easily adaptable to containers. And there's a reason for that, especially in our area. The, the uh, need for container gardening um, is, is uh, quite extensive. So there are four steps to container gardening. There's container selection, and I think they're behind me here as well. Soil mix, plant selection and care, and maintenance, and then I like to add a fifth one, which is, is creation. You need to be able to create it as well. So uh, that's kind of my fifth one. But these are the four that are generally listed as the steps to container gardening. So selecting a container. Uh, almost anything that holds soil and has drain holes can be a container. Um, I can attest to this. I have watering cans. I've got galvanized buckets. I have old fire pits, gutters. I've grown anything and just about anything that we were going to throw out or I've actually bought some of those, like the old watering can. Um, you need to have adequate drainage. The only exception is some self-watering. I'll go through those very briefly. They aren't all that popular, but I'm just interested in them. Um, you can use a tray or something to elevate it so that those holes drain. I've had many of a plant on, on, the, on my porch not drain correctly because the holes have gotten clogged. And you often get um, pill bugs and other things underneath which drag the dirt down as well. Um, I elevate all my plants slightly. Um, if you have a, a tray in those, it does the job as well. Um, you just need to be careful if you do have a drain for mosquitoes, not let the water connect, collect in there for any period of time. And this just shows drilling some holes in containers or buckets or whatever. I even have trash cans. I'll show you later that, that I've, I've turned into containers. And on the right, you can see the, uh, the little flowering uh, container there. That's actually a watering can, which the... Uh, the flower is actually grown over the entire, entire uh, size of the can. And actually, right behind it there is actually the calamondin. So selecting a container. There are a whole series of containers that are out there now. Um, I have a lot of all of these. Um, terracotta, glazed, and, and plastic are the most, most uh, widely used uh, materials. Um, you need to select those things that are going to be good for you. you know, consider the porosity, the cost, the winter hardiness, location, and weight. I typically don't put keep large trees. I've got six or seven large trees outside on my patio now. I get to, we don't put those in into the glazed pots, even though they're my favorite, just because of the freeze um, problems that you can get with those. They're actually in very large decorative plastic pots. Um, location, weight, I'll go through that in a second as well. So uh, terracotta, you know, everybody knows terracotta pots, um, porous, um, they can lead to fairly dry soil here, but really good luck with succulents outside in terracotta plot, pots. Um, they do retain their heat, so they, they actually keep the, everything warm overnight, and they are susceptible to freezing and chipping. They can absorb water, and when, when uh, it freezes, you know, that can, uh, that can uh, chip the pot, cause it to crack. Um, one thing that I do like to do on some of my terracotta pots where I want to, I don't, I like the look, I like what they do, but they just lose too much water is I actually will put a plastic bag in, cut the bottom out of it, and kind of line the inside of it so that you don't get the uh, permeability of the, uh, the ceramic. The glazed pots are probably my favorite. I have a number of those. I reuse those every year. I do clean them out and store them during the course of the winter and then bring them back outside in the springtime. And plastic pots, lightweight, inexpensive, but sometimes can look kind of inexpensive like the tomatoes that you see here, but they have such a variety of, of pots that you can get now in containers in, uh, you know, made out of plastic that is it's really amazing. They last for a long time, they're lightweight, and they're easy to move around. Um, this bottom one was, I wouldn't call it a mistake. I, I would say I, would, I didn't think it through as well as I probably should have. 
I had seen where they had made some concrete containers online. I said, well, I could do that. So I made a mold and mixed up the concrete and I poured it and uh, you know, took, took it out of the mold and then realized it weighed several hundred pounds. So the family helped me move it, this one. And I made actually two of them. They've both been in those locations for about 13 or 14 years now. This is their final resting spot. It is extremely durable, however. I'm sure it will outlive me, um, but it's never going to be moved from where it's at. One has a fur in it, and next to the other one has a uh, choke cherry in it. And both of them do extremely well year after year. Uh, one big thing about selecting a container, and something that I haven't always gotten right, and the winds here remind me of it the entire summer long, is to select a container that is going to fit the final size of your pot, unless you plan on repotting it. Um, I don't like to repot things as much. I have. I repotted a tree not that long, about a year and a half ago, and retore my rotator cuff. So get the pot size that, that you would like it to be. So you can see all the same plant, but it, they do have a tendency to grow to their final height. But my biggest problem generally, though, is that the container is too small to hold the height of the plant in any kind of wind, and everything tips over. Um, I'm just interested in self-watering self containers. They aren't all that popular, but this is one of my favorite ones. It just has a little wick in the bottom. You fill it full of water, you put it in. I've tried them outside. They work fairly well. We have just a few containers. It is a, an option. You can also create your own. There's some things online. Some of these get, get fairly creative that you can buy. Um, I, I'm just probably more interested in some of the engineering of it than, than anything else, but uh, just another type of container that you can get. And then non-traditional tables, such as a salad table. Um, I enjoy microgreens and other, other um, greens during the course of the year, and I'll show you what mine looks like in a second. But online, there are so many different uh, uh, instructions and, and uh, diagrams, how to build your own tables, how to make your own salad tables or, or larger. This was the one, and actually I dismantled it because it wasn't large enough. And I actually made one this year that's four by eight, eight feet. Um, but I have right here cilantro, some microgreens growing, um, another um, flat that has microgreens that were just planted in it. Um, we've done sort of doing a lot of our basil out there. Um, I have one area in the garden, and it's hard to, for me to rotate, that has zinnias in it, which tend to get powdery mildew later in the year and have tended to want to spread that powdery mildew to our basil. So I've been doing basil in pots as well. And in fact, this is another container on here that I like quite a bit. These are these, these felt, felt pots. They're very lightweight. Um, they last several years. In fact, I just put these two out again. They have parsley, um, cilantro, oregano in them. Um, this is the third or fourth year I've had them out there. And, uh, you know, they, they've done incredibly well. And then in the bottom right are two containers that are very non-traditional. They're small garbage cans. We have chickens. I had chicken feed. Kept them out by the coop. The rodents ate through the lids, so that gave me two trash cans with no lids. So I use them for carrots now. I've always had some trouble with carrots in the garden. They tend to like to pop out of the ground. Um, not, I have no problem with these. You can see how healthy they are. Um, they, they look fantastic. So there, there's a lot of different options in terms of non-traditional containers, non-traditional growing areas that you can uh, think about when you're selecting a container. Soil mixtures. Um, it's, it's recommended to use a soilless mixture. Um, garden soil is generally too compact. Um, you need some air in there for, for the roots to breathe. Um, peat is probably the most common uh, material that's in the, in the uh, planting, planting soils now. The, and um, it's very fibrous, good water retention, gives bad added nutrients so it doesn't absorb them, it gives them back to the roots but it is not renewable. And we've gone to try to, to buy potting mixes and so forth that have little or no peat in them. Um, compost, composted pine bark, and coir are very common alternatives now. And some of it is, is I can admit, it's, it gets harder to find, or it's hard to find the alternatives. Because right now I think they're, they're mining a lot of the peat from Canada. It's fairly cheap for them to do that. Right now, um, hopefully they're going to switch over. 
I try to buy things that have have all or significant amount of coir in it if I if I possibly can. Um, sand, which adds some weight and to the drainage. You know, you just have the peat and these other two ingredients, perlite and vermic vermicite, which are very common additives. It um, it's a very very light mixture. So sometimes I'll add sand to it to uh, to try to increase the uh, the weight. You can, uh, if you're ambitious, you can try to tailor your own mixture. Um, you know, using some type of aggregate um, for for drier plants such as, as succulents, um, coir compost, um, bark for moisture, clay sand for top heavy plants. Um, compost is great; it supplies all the major minor nutrients. You may still have to supplement a little bit. Um, it has a size distribution to allow the drainage, but it doesn't hold the water very well. Um, I've seen recommendations to use a 50-50 mix, soilless mix, and I had use a lot every year. I'm going this next year. I'm actually going to try to find my own source of coir in bulk, and then mix my own with with compost. Um, I think it'd be number one cheaper for me, and number two just better for for our environment. Um, most soilless mixtures do not have any kind of fertilizer in them. Some do. You need to read the package carefully and for how long it says it's going to last. But um, most do not. So if it has compost in it or, or composted worm droppings or, or uh, some of the other ones that we have here, I'll, I'll go over in a second. Some of the ingredients are, are, are pretty fantastic. Um, it, it has enough fertilizer that it may last three, four months, but read the bag. It will tell you what, uh, what the time period is. Remember, organic doesn't re re mean renewable. Um, one of the organic ones that I had had peat, composted pine bark, pasteurized poultry litter. Um, I have several of them here. Another had processed forest products, coir, perlite, yucca, and organic fertilizer. So even though they, they, they say they're organic. That doesn't necessarily mean that these are renewable resources. And neither is the perlite or vermiculite or any of those as well. Those are mined minerals. Um, you can use oil soilless mix, old soilless mix. I've had this question quite a few times. Um, you do weigh some of your advantages. You know, the advantages being, you know, the, the uh, porosity. Uh, of, the, of the material. It tends to, to break down over time. Um, that said, I have several trees out on my porch here that have been there for 15 years and they're very healthy. They survive each winter and they look great. Um, if you're going to do a bunch of them though, I have read where it's nice to be able to use like a 50-50 potting mix. As long as you had something that didn't have any diseases the year before because that's another one of the advantages of using new mix every year is that you started with something that has has no pre-existing uh, diseases in it. Well, there are specialty mixes for plants that require less water. I did add a little section in here on succulents. They've become one of my new favorites outside. Um, tends to improve uh, drainage quality. Okay, so uh, number three, plant selection. Um, anybody who's ever seen a master gardener say anything has seen that saying right there, right plant, right place. It's a lot easier when you're doing container gardening to have the right plant in the right place. It's not married to that location. You can move that pot wherever you want. It's not getting enough sun. It's getting too much sun. You can generally find a place somewhere in your yard that can accommodate it. There are so many plant choices. And seriously, I think I've tried everything in a pot at one time or another. Um, it's typically good to group plants that have similar growing characteristics with each other. You don't want some, you know, a succulent with uh, something that that's going to require a lot of a lot of um, water with it. Locate, of course, locate plants where they thrive. Um, consider the mature size. We discussed that a little um, bit ago. It's something that's not always easy to do. Um, I've made containers and just had one plant completely overwhelmed. Um, even though I've read the instructions and. You know, it grows to such and such height, but you put it out, you put it in direct sunlight, in a shallower plant, roots are warmer, and it gets very large. So consider the mature size. doesn't always work, but it's something that you need to do. Um, of course, the water and the light requirements. Um, future location of pots, like the uh, uh, pot that I had just there, or trees. 
um, my large tree, I have one in the back, it's in a very large pot. It's never going to move until that pot decides it's not going to hold water anymore. And overwintering, the rule of thumb is generally it needs to be two zones less than you're in. So for us, that would be a hardiness zone of nine in order to be able to survive the winter. And even then, I had some river birch out back in pots, and um, that didn't turn out well. We, they, it tended to, they tended to leaf out earlier, and we had a freeze, and it actually um, froze the tips of it. So that doesn't always work out quite as well either because a lot of the plants that are in pots tend to mature earlier and come out of winter faster. Than, uh, than those that aren't. And it allows you, again, seasonal considerations. That little planter on the left is one I actually gave my son-in-law to sit by his grill. It doesn't follow all of my recommendations in that um, I just threw all the herbs that he might be using in there, regardless of, of their, their water content, but they all thrive. In fact, everything looks great right now in that pot, except for the basil and the dill aren't there through the winter. They just left it by their back porch. But the, uh, the sage, the oregano, the rosemary, the thyme are all there. So I actually grow dill and basil in the basement, and I'll take two down and pop them in, and his, uh, his little uh, garden will be complete again. So that's our segue into vegetables. Um, again, if you like organic gardening, it's a great way to garden. It's, it's fairly pest-free. Not totally pest-free, but, but fairly pest-free. Um, I had some hot peppers kind of grown for ornament and for the peppers out and noticed one day a lot of the leaves missing and there was a very large tomato hornworm on it which had decimated half the plant in a day because I water every day so you still do get the pests but not they're not as prevalent as they would be in a garden in a garden and I've never had to spray any of my my uh, containers for anything um, everything's been they're very it's very hand pickable and I've actually not had to do anything with them over the years um, if you're growing uh, vegetables, it is generally um, suggested to get bush type or smaller ones, um, varietals to go in the pots, you know, like this little patio tomato up on the top right, uh, eggplants, um, peppers, that smaller, smaller pepper plants, ornamental pepper plants are great. Both eggplant and, and peppers like hot roots. They do great in uh, containers. Beans, carrots, Swiss chard, cucumbers, eggplant, tomatoes. They're all great choices. I've tried them all. And herbs, again, you should try to, to put things together that, that have similar light and, and water requ um, requirements. Um, you know, in this case, my, all of this had done really well on, on their porch. And I often find, too, with, with in terms of watering, that our summers are so warm here, I end up watering once every day anyways, even a lot of my succulents that I have outside because it just it doesn't have enough to retain the, the water. We get too warm. Um, you plant these at the same time that you would as in a regular garden, um, any of your, your vegetables. And do remember that most vegetables require at least six hours of direct sunlight. Um, again, you can move them around to fit it, move them around as the, the, the height of the sun is, it comes out of spring into summer and back into fall. Um, but they, most vegetables do require at least six hours of sun. Um, I, uh, there's so much help out there for um, choosing plants and choosing plant sizes. Um, this one right here is a Virginia Tech um, uh, publication. It, it goes over the size and what you know, different things that they recommend. There's many of these out on the web. This is probably one of my favorites and one of my favorite uh, but my favorite publications as well. Um, I always keep it handy. And just down below is, is, what, is what it shows there. Um, a lot of the things that came out of this talk, a lot of the talking points came out of that, uh, that article. And as we were saying, this is one, another one of my favorite charts, is um, when to plant outside. Um, the, the nice thing is, is that if you do happen to plant something that it that could be susceptible to an early freeze, like like last week, um, and it's in a pot, you just take it into your garage, put it in the house for the evening, take it back outside again. So uh, this again is, is another publication through uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension, and uh, and is a very good uh, is a very good um, 
guide to when to uh, put vegetables in the garden, and in this case, in pots. Flowering plants, I love flowering plants as well. We have a very large deck. I have all kinds of things out there to uh, accent it. Um, a list of begonias, I'm not gonna go through the whole list here, zinnias. The only problem I've had with zinnias is they tend to grow tall. You need a fairly big pot. They're awfully small when I grow them in my basement and put them out there, but uh, they, they grow quite big. Uh, and then a few, uh, a few um, suggestions at the bottom, different things that you can, can do or use. I've gotten a lot of my inspiration just from online, looking at things. Um, I'll show you one of my favorite uh, gardens to go to um, in a second. Um, you know, I imitating other, pe other people's designs is, uh, is a great way to uh, know that something's going to look good without having to guess when you're putting it together at a, at a garden center. Um, typically, you want to kind of create a focal point. Um, you want some either symmetrical or asymmetric balance. I typically like a fairly asymmetrical pot, but either one. Um, vary the material that you're using. Um, this is often called, you know, the thriller, filler, and spiller, right? Something large in the center which catches your eye, something to fill the area around it, and then something to come over the containers. Um, echo uh, colors and color harmonies, um, leaf shapes. Um, I, I suggest setting, if you're going to create one of these, set it up inside the garden center or wherever you're at while you're, while you're buying the plants and put them side by side. Not all colors go together, I found, and I'm not that great at predicting what will, but putting them side by side, you can definitely uh, get a really good feel for, uh, for what's going to happen. And even in this spot, I think that this one on the right, they probably thought those caladiums are going to be a little bit taller than they're going to be. They're kind of getting taken over by the impatience. Oh, excuse me. One of the one of the hazards of being at home. Um, plant selection, flowering plants. Um, I get my inspiration from many sources. Uh, the plants that I just showed you, building the really pretty containers. I generally only have a few of those at one given time. I have a lot of single species. I have a lot of perennials that I put out, which I buy during the year because they're flowering at that time, and then plant them in my garden later. So try to plan ahead and uh, try not to dig up more of my lawn to put them in, but that happens as well. Um, here are some, some great inspiration. This is from the Metal Art Botanical Gardens, which has some really beautiful pots, and I fell in love with a lot of the things that they had out there, but just a whole series of different, uh, different types of things that you can plant. You know, they have, they have baskets that have sing, or, uh, containers that have single um, species in them, ones that have multiple. Um, again, here's some more, and then this was actually my inspiration to start doing some more uh, succulent gardening, is I love their succulent garden pots. They were uh, really inspirational when I was there. Okay, so we're moving right along. I talked fairly fast. Number four is maintenance. Um, you need to water when the first half inch is dry, uh, first inch is dry, and you need to water all the way through the pot and use those holes at the very bottom. Um, it's, it's kind of important. Um, fertilize, like I said, you read the bag, see what it says on it. Most of the plants, most, or a lot of the soil is missing, you have no fertilizer in them and have very little, unless they've added some of these other things like um, poultry litter or what's another good example here, um, you know, or compost, it, it really doesn't have a whole lot of nutrients. So you need to read, read what they are telling you to do when you, um, when you uh, get the, uh, the, when you look at the container. Remember to prune and deadhead, especially if you have annuals out there. Prune them, have them keep coming back. Advantage the annuals generally is they bloom over an extremely long period of time. And there's my tomato hornworm, not mine, just a generic one. They all look the same. Um, and do, do be watchful for them. You don't have to be quite as diligent as I am in my my vegetable garden, but um, they, they do like to uh, eventually find their way to pots if they can. Um, I put this one in um, just recently. I've given a talk on, on succulents, and again, I told you that it's one of my favorites. And succulents are a good, good way to kind of tie a lot of this in together um, in that it encompasses a lot of the, uh, the uh, 
the basics of, of container gardening. We like I like them so much that at my daughter's wedding we actually made made the uh, the seed assignments. You can see in the upper right there out of succulents, little tags for everybody to bring home. Um, of course, with this drainage is paramount, just like with everything else, but even more so in succulents. You need to have very, very good drainage. Um, when you're transplanting them, you need to be very careful. Often their roots are very, very fragile. Anybody who's dealt a lot with succulents, you'll open up the pot, and oftentimes the, the soil that it was in just falls away, leaving a very shallow root system. Uh, choose a pot that's not too big for these, one that it's going to kind of grow in and fill. Um, soil must be well drained. Um, generally, I do have some that, some larger succulents that I've just put in general potting mix. They make special potting mixes just for succulents, which tend to drain better. Uh, many commercial uh, um, uh, mixtures on the market, and again, organic does not guarantee that it's going to be renewable. Um, Lots of options for making your own online. I didn't put any down here, but there's just a whole series of different um, uh, mixes that you can make if you get online and look. Um, watering, uh, they don't need to be a lot, of, a lot of water, but they really need to be sitting in water. So if there's a dish underneath, you need to dump that dish when you're done, done with it. Um, they should dry out between watering. My, my succulents, and I have quite a few that I put outside, I typically don't have trouble with that. A lot of them are in terracotta pots, and one day out in our sunshine, they're bone dry. So I often tend to water my succulents outside quite often because you don't want them to, to, to dry out and then remain dry. Um, they will start to, to wilt a little bit. You'll be able to kind of tell when they're getting too little, but I've had it be just too late, not watering enough, and that they don't recover. Um, they have natural growing cycles. Um, so they want, they want to be warm and, and well watered during the natural cycle and cool. Well, I have several that I bring in and I actually put them down in the basement. Uh, they do fairly well bringing in and out. They don't look quite as good when you bring them, you know, after, after they've been in the basement for, uh, for the winter. But uh, they, they look all right and they bounce back. Um, uh, avoid watering in small frequent amounts, right? Just like with the other ones, soak them all the way through. Um, remove any water from the drain tray, and like I said, seconds will wilt a little bit. They'll show signs that they aren't getting enough enough water. And again, there was the picture that, that launched me into my, my love for succulents outdoors. And as like I said, most thrive outside quite well. Um, some might like a little bit of shade. So again, read the plant. Right plant, right place. Um, some varieties... Do prosper in direct sunlight and research that. Um, they can get some mealybugs and scales. A little bit of alcohol is done me well, insecticidal soap, um, depending on what it is. So type what kind of, of uh, disease it might have, what kind of bug or insect, and then look for the pro appropriate uh, remedy for that. Um, acclimating to, to indoor conditions um, after summer vacation, this is, this is good advice for everything. Um, Avoid drastic temperature changes, and as I said, outdoor seconds need more frequent water than indoor. Everything needs more more outdoor. I typically water my plants in the in the containers outside every day. And then finally, I've gone kind of quick, but I've given this talk a lot. <laughs> is uh, creation. So it's not recommended to fill the bottom with rocks. You don't need to fill the bottom with rocks. The only time I ever fill the bottom of a container is when I have very, very large containers. I know the roots won't make it as deep as it is, and we'll go through that in a, in a second. You need to cover the holes, um, you know, with stone, a stone or screen. Um, I made the mistake of covering the holes with a very round rock once, which ended up being a plug. So be careful what you put over it, and the water still needs to drain out. Um, and that's, that is the most important thing. I had two really pretty red twig dogwoods that I stationed at the top of our walk-up in very large pots. I always worry about people falling down the walk-ups. So I, I put those out there. And uh, they, they had been in the pots for several years, and the tops started to look poorly. So I thought, well, they've just outgrown their containers. 
So I wheeled them out into the yard with my hand cart and put them in the location I was going to put them. And when I pulled them out of the pots, you could smell the rotting material inside. The holes, even though I drilled many holes in the bottom over the years, have become quite plugged. Um, the, neither one made it, actually, um, in the yard. And uh, since then, I took those same containers, cleaned them out very well, and, dr and drilled larger holes in it to assure that I get better drainage. Um, as I just said, we, it's not suggested to put rocks and other things in the bottom a large amount. Um, but if you, you have large pots, you can put things. You're always wondering what to do with those peanuts or plastic bottles or so forth. The ones that I grow the carrots in are actually a little too deep. So I have material in the bottom of those. I can't even remember what it is now. And then I put landscape fabric over that so it naturally drains down through and doesn't, doesn't collect as much water. You want to fill near to the proper, proper depth, remembering that the plant itself is going to take up some volume within that pot. And uh, then arrange to suit your test. Kind of put on your growth glasses and imagine what it's going to look like in a few years and, or a few, years, <laughs> few, few months and try to picture out what's going to happen and, and how to plant it in there. I'm a notorious overplanter. I tend to put way too much in pots when I put things in there. Um, it, it tends to look nice, but towards the end of the season, it does show signs of strain. Um, remove the plants and loosen the roots. Uh, it seems like almost anything that I buy nowadays is very, very much root bound. I typically take the plant off. I loosen up the roots a little bit. Fill in the large gaps with, with, with soilless mixture again. And if you're going to put a fertilizer in, it has none. I do like the time release fertilizers. It tells you how much for how big of a pot. Uh, that way I don't have to worry about it. Um, and then water well, and then go back and refill in any holes that you might have, because those might tend to collapse areas that weren't filled in as well. And you don't want to pack the soil down. You just want to put the soil into the container. And then, of course, you know, enjoy your container. There's so many other small space options out there as well. In the upper right, um, this isn't a picture of it. This is actually one that I, I grabbed online. But we did one of these for a friend of mine who lives in Old Town Manassas of growing cucumbers up the side of their fence. It takes literally no room at all. And, uh, you know, except for that, that, that thin strip at the bottom, and worked extremely well. Um, the other trellising methods shown at the bottom here, it looks like they have some type of uh, a bean growing up. That one, I particularly like this one in the bottom middle with the large containers that they put down the side of their house. You don't have a lot of room. It's a great way to be able to grow, grow vegetables and, and flowers or anything in a very small and confined space. Um, if you're doing something like any kind of raised bed or whatever, um, soil preparation, I'm not going to get into that with, within this class, but it's another way, great way, uh, terracing and so forth, to be able to get a container, essentially a container in a small area outside. Uh, these are some slides that have, that have been added, um, you know, for social media. Um, there's a number of resources for which you can keep in touch with the Master Gardeners, ask questions and so forth containers or otherwise. And um, there's the uh, address for the horticultural help desk. Again, if you have any, any type of questions on, on, gardening, uh, on gardening in general or landscaping or whatever in your yard, this is, this is where you can go. And these are just some examples, um, maybe not all my best, of, of some of the things that I've had growing in my yard. And uh, I thank you. Thomas, are you asking the questions? Okay. I hope I didn't go too fast. No, you did great. I have a tendency to uh, not slow down. Uh, let me see. There were a couple questions, and I'm just going to scroll down. And if anybody has new, uh, questions, please ask. One second. Uh, how deep should pots be for the carrots? The container volume could differ based on the shape of the pot. Um, it's a, I, mine are, are deep. Um, 
the, the length of the carrot will, will depend on it, um, of course. For standard carrot, and then the, the length below that, and you're going to have to have a fairly deep container for that. They, they make much smaller carrots, like the type you can buy in the stores, the, the small baby carrots. Um, they make some round ones that are really nice, too, that can go in shallower pots. But I would almost double the depth, I think, for a carrot in terms of how deep the soil would be um, in the pot. They, they do send roots down besides the taproot. I, I grow purple, red, and white ones. Kind of a almost a uh, patriotic theme. Can't, can't find blue as easily. I got purple ones. How would pawpaw trees do, uh, would pawpaw trees do well in containers in the beginning stages? Um, they might. Um, I have two in my backyard that I actually bought. Um, they're in the ground now, but uh, they were all container grown. Um, and they were fairly large when I bought them. They were probably three feet tall or so and grown, grown in containers. So I, I would think that they would probably do fairly well. I ha I've been able to grow almost all trees and shrubs. I like to have things out on the, on the deck that, that shade and you know, provide some interest. I've had Nandine cherries, um, just about anything. Uh, let's see what's out there now. I've got two, looking out here, now, I have two hydrangea. I have a lilac. I've got several that never go anywhere, filberts and other things, contorted filberts. So I think that there's a lot of varieties that, that do well in containers. And a lot of them are grown in, in containers originally. That's how you, you buy them. Um, I just watch their size and how big they are. The one that's in the upper right there in this picture is now quite a large tree, and that one's not moving anywhere. And actually the mulch in it, and you can tell we probably have too much fun out on our patio, is, uh, is all corks <laughs> from uh, wine bottles. So uh, there is this question about adding gravel or stone to the bottom of the container, and I know you mentioned this, and we had a, a blog about it last year. There's quite a bit of research from Oregon State University saying that if you have gravel at the bottom of the container, it actually just raises the water table up and can cause root rot. Have you found that to be true too? Yeah, I've stopped doing, I've stopped doing that. Um, I, I use all soil and if not, if like if the container is like so big, I have put filler in there, but then I've made an artificial bottom with the roots won't grow through on top of that with landscape fabric usually doubled over and put in there um, so that the roots don't, you know, it, it has a barrier and they stop growing there and they don't grow down into that area. Yeah. Um, Cause I, I used to I remember when I used to put a lot in the bottom, you, you pull it out and you could smell the, uh, the, the rotting material, you know, trapped between the stones at the bottom. Yeah. So no, I don't do that anymore. I, uh, I, I have though added filler to them. Um, just just because I don't I, I don't I don't want to spend the money to fill up the entire container like the garbage cans. Plus, it's much heavier when you put a bunch of rocks in the bottom. Yeah, it's it's difficult sometimes to find the right size thing. As, like I said, to to cover the holes, you kind of need something down there in a lot of the holes. That they do leak leak out uh, um, soil during the course of the year. We have a question about blueberries. I just bought three blueberry plants which I have to grow in pots, how do I know what kind of soil to add to the soil in the original pot? I'm going to report, uh, report them immediate, uh, repot them immediately to a larger pot. Do blueberries like a particular soil combination? I'm not sure. They, they like a more acidic soil. Jeff, I um, can answer that. Oh, well, thank you. Um, most blueberries grow in sandier soils. Um, largely for the drainage, but you really want a very acidic, I think blueberries are somewhere around pH of five is what they like, maybe five and a half. Um, they do very well in containers because their root system is not extensive. Uh, in practice, when we start a new blueberry field commercially, we just use a big auger and drill holes in a field and amend those holes only, um, which saves a lot of time and money. 
Um, so you can grow blueberries very well in containers. Just make sure the, the soil is fairly acidic. And I've never seen them, I've never seen a sandy soilless media that's available commercially, but I have seen blueberries grown in pots all the time in just regular soilless media. Um, if you decide you want to add some sand, I wouldn't go really heavy on it. Okay, is there a risk of the pot being too large and causing rot or other problems? I I wouldn't think so. I mean, you want to maximize your, your space. Um, I do know that with, with succulents, they don't want you to use too large of a pot, and that may be a root issue. I'm not sure exactly why they want you to restrict the size of those. Um, but... I can't think of a lot of reasons why having too large of a container would would be a problem. Um, I, I'm just like thinking in general landscaping and so forth. They have kind of free run. Um, I, I can't think of any any good reasons why. Can we have more examples of the thriller filler and spiller plant types? Um, there are a lot more. Um, I'm going to zip back here a little ways. Um, typically, I like, like a Dracinium spike or some type of a uh, – uh, I've used caladiums. I like those a lot in the center. I, whoa, where did we go here? Let go of the mouse. Um, I've, I've used all kinds of different things um, in, the, in the centers that, that are fairly tall that add some interest. And they can be flowering or not flowering. Um, around the edges, um, I wish I had very good luck in this area with geraniums. Um, you can see on, this, on the far right one, it looks like they've used a heuchera around it as well. Um, anything that is fairly bushy and doesn't grow very large makes a great, great center area, um, you know, for the, the filler part of it. You see, they didn't even, I like this one on the far right a lot. It's, it's not really a flowering, but they've used so many interesting things in it. Um, that, that are, are fairly non-traditional for, for a pot. And it looks like maybe a sweet potato vine or something that they've used to grow over the side. Um, I have one big mistake that I did in my garden is I, I put creeping Jenny out there. This is before I was a master gardener. I, I put it out in the yard, and it, it, it didn't creep. It just rampaged. It was everywhere. Um, I spent probably two years getting it all up. There's still some of it out there, though. I can't get rid of it all. So every year we go out and we pull some of it and we use it as, as uh, spillovers in pots. You can see the third pot over. there. That, that pot has um, Creeping Jenny in the, the bottom of it there. So you can use almost anything. I mean, that, that third one over, they, they, they've used, what, a canna in the center? And um, almost looks like a fuchsia of some type or something that they've used on the side of it. And non-symmetrical as well. So there's all kinds of different choices that you can use. The hardest one sometimes for me is the, was what I would want for the centerpiece coming up. But uh, there, there's a lot of them. I, I like just going online and, and browsing and, and looking what, what they use. Oftentimes if you go onto those websites, you know, they'll give a plant description of what they had. Um, Fine Gardening has had some very nice um, exposés on, on doing this. Um, and I think you can find most of that online as well. Uh, I find a lot on Pinterest myself. Yes. What? Uh, which citrus trees will do well in a container? Uh, the citrus, I've, personally, I've had, uh, the biggest problem I have with the citrus is that, that they have to come in over the winter. Um, I've kept my calamondin alive over the years, but it hasn't been easy, I and mean, it's taken quite a bit of pruning. I've had branches die and so forth. I've, I personally have tried um, limes and, and other things without the greatest of success. And generally for me, it's been in the going in inside and outside with, with the problems. They haven't, they, they do great in the summertime in the pots outside. They thrive, they're fantastic, often flowering. Uh, I love the citrus smell. Uh, I grew up in Florida. I can remember the the, the vast fields of uh, 
orange grows and smells when I go back and forth to school. Uh, but uh, I, 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 I've had problems with it. Um, they, I guess they, they really don't like the dryness when you bring them in in the wintertime. They tend to lose a lot of leaves. My one that's downstairs now doesn't look so good, but I have kept it alive. I, I can't, I'm not sure if any would be better than any other. I would have to imagine the larger, the more difficult it would be to be able to uh, keep it alive coming in and out. Um, if you're going to do something, I would probably use something that was more compact and smaller and didn't, didn't grow to a very large size. Um, can you talk more about renewable soil? Do you mean needing new soil each year versus reusing soil from the previous growing season? Yeah, I mean, in general, it's recommended to use a new soil. I mean, that's one of the best, the two, two big advantages of using the new soil is that it's got good drainage. It has lots of airspace in it, and it is also free of any possible diseases from the year before. Um, when you reuse it, 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 it has some of those advantages are gone. That's why perhaps if you're going to reuse it, and it has some, there's nothing in there, adding some new mix into it to kind of freshen it up helps as well. Um, I said, I'm not as worried generally about the disease part. Um, I rarely have disease issues unless something has happened within the container itself. The, the bottom has become plugged, something along those lines where you can get, get some type of uh, root rot or uh, uh, be more prone to, to fungal attack. Um, I've rarely had any of those kind of issues. Um, I'd be more concerned with the ability to drain. Well, like I've said, um, I have, I'm looking out here at the window right now, I have two hydrangeas out there that are absolutely beautiful year after year. They've been in pots six, maybe seven years now, so I can't imagine them becoming much more compacted. Um, but that is the general recommendation. Uh, the one I liked was like the 50-50 mix. And I will do that. I have an area that I dump some of my, my soilless mix in, and I will reuse some of it every year, particularly in the bigger pots. Here's a question about planting thyme, uh, the different times, uh, French, English, German, lemon, together. This uh, person had, at, um, had heard that they might lose their individual flavors. Have you found that true? No. Um, I haven't really grown as many together. I have um, a French and a German I've started this year that were going out. Um, I'm, I'm unsure about that. I don't think I've noticed that, but I, I didn't, I know I hadn't heard that before. So maybe I should check myself. I've never heard. Yeah, maybe my palate either. isn't good enough either. I, mean, I can't totally tell the difference anyways. Yeah. Do you mulch the top of your pots that are wintering? Um, the, my big pots that I keep outside, um, I have mulched, um, I've used several different ones in the past. I typically like things that are light and can, can pass through. I must admit, I like my corks. If you're a wine drinker, you gather a whole, whole slew of them. Uh, they've actually worked quite well. Um, I have used various, various mulches. I, the only problem I seem to have with the mulches and pots is they tend to then they do tend to, to gather some some fungal issues. Um, they don't. There's, it doesn't breathe as well at the top. But um, for the trees and things that I have outside, right now they're just all mulched actually with cork. It probably gives them some, probably gives them less, more protection against evaporation than it does for anything else. But because mulching at the top, you still have the whole rest of the container that can get cold. So I would think that the best for anything that's going outside and going to stay out all winter long is to have something that's that's hardy to two zones from where we are, hardy to zone nine. There's a question about which herbs uh, should not be in the same container. Um, Cher had a bad experience with cilantro and dill last year. No. Cher, what, oh. what, what was your problem? Cher, did they bolt or what happened? Maybe you can... Let me know. Me my know. problem, my problem was that um, the something happened to the cilantro. It just kind of took over dill qualities or something, and the cilantro tasted terrible. Oh. 
Well, I've had bad problems with cilantro when it's grown too large, mm-hmm. when it starts to get up near seed level, not tasting as good. Um, yeah, my trick generally with my cilantro is I, I've always grown it in a single pot by itself. And then once every few weeks, I punch a couple more seeds into the ground and I get a continuous growth. And when they get it up and they start to flower, I just chop those ones down and let the rest of them grow through it. Um, that's my cilantro trick. It's, it's worked really well. You just have to remember to go out and put seeds in every once in a while. Um, we really like cilantro, but I know what you mean. Sometimes it can taste almost, almost tasteless. Um, and I wasn't sure if that was just from age and, you know, um, getting to the point where it's starting to produce, uh, produce flowers. Thomas, what were you going to say? You grow it at um, the teaching garden. Yeah, typically the larger it gets, the less palatable it is. Um, the trick with any of the annual herbs is really to use them. Um, mm-hmm. You know, start when they're young and, you know, that continuous pruning um, will should keep the flavor much better than letting them grow big and tall. To grow herbs in window boxes, what else can be added to create color? Oh, well, that's a good question. I hadn't really thought about that uh, to put in with herbs. Uh, it really depends uh, on how big of a window box. Yeah. There's, there's some lettuces you could probably do. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Lettuce would be good. Ruby, romaine. How large a container is recommended for berries? I recently purchased purchased blueberries, blackberries, and raspberries. Um, I think it would have to depend on how big a varietal, especially the blueberries, get to be. Um, I'd ha- I would have to do some research on that as well in order to determine what the best the, the best size is. I mean, the, the I have raspberries and blackberries, but they're in the ground, and uh, I haven't uh, I haven't researched that enough to, uh, to to provide a great answer. Thomas, do you have any ideas? Um, I think pretty large I've, for. I have seen with the right management. I've seen. Um, blackberries and raspberries grown in basically three gallon pots um but it's a more intensive system they do that in greenhouses um for commercial production for home use the, what i would worry about with with raspberries and um, blackberries is is how you were going to trellis them mm-hmm. they tend to work better in the ground i think uh, with blueberries i would say at least probably a 16 inch pot um, but i wouldn't go too crazy with it because again it's got a, a relatively compact um root system so there was a question about pawpaw trees have you gotten any fruit i have personally i i grow pawpaws and i haven't seen fruit on any of the smaller trees yet no mine are four, five years old, and I got a decent number of flowers last year, but nothing. I'm hoping this year I'm going to see something off of them. I was very excited about them. Oh, yeah, I love pawpaws. They're the best. Does yeah, they're, they're extremely healthy. They look great. I've got a ton of blossoms on them right now that they're just starting to open up. I'm hoping we don't have another freeze that will uh, knock them down, but... Does cork mulch work well? I have bags, a bag of corks and peach and a peach tree in a pot that needs mulch. Yeah, I, I've, I've had great luck with the corks, um, except for my daughter's dog who likes to come steal them and chew them up. Um, <laughs> they've been fantastic for me. Um, I, I saw it somewhere. I can't remember where and gave it a try on a limited basis. And then just we started saving them all. And I've been using them out there. It, 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 it's, uh, I like the repurposing aspect of it. I would have thought that they would get a lot of mildew, but they really haven't. They tend to dry out first um, when you water them. Um, 
I, I do stir them around a little bit occasionally, but and they look they look nice and they're an interesting uh, an interesting mulch to have. I don't see any other questions, but some uh, a number of people suggested adding edible flowers to their herb boxes, and I would oh, say yeah. nasturtiums are great color and yeah. edible flowers. That's a suggestion. They like oh, that's a great suggestion. They like the sun. Oh, one more. I think that's it. This is one more message I can't get to. Oh. Oh, here we go. Are there any? One minute. Are there any not uh, nose for cork use? Is any real cork okay for use? Um, as far as I know, um, I haven't had any, I haven't had any issues. I don't think it's been scientifically studied. <laughs> um, so, you know, I can't give you any absolutes or, or any positives about that. Um, but it's, it's just another nice, nice way to reuse something and uh, make it useful and have it look, look good as well. I like them in my big pots because those they have a large surface area on top. They tend to lose a lot of water during the course of the day. So I have I have liked them on those. In the summertime, on a lot of my trees, I used to put down other types of mulch. Um, I had used like the uh, the coconut husk, the one that's they're not coir. It's uh, they, they they used to sell quite a lot of it. I put that down. But that tended to also be a little tight sometimes and and grow fungus as well, which of course, you don't want out there. It's been one of the better ones that I found in order to keep keep well keep the uh, moisture in. Yeah, well, natural cork comes from the same. I mean, there, there's only one source for it, the same type of tree. So oh. I can't imagine there'd be any any problem with using it on, in any type of mulch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I typically haven't used the the plastic synthetic ones. I've kept those out. Um, but I've used the composite corks, and they've been fine. And since they have to be, uh, they they have to be uh, you know rated for for food processing as well, right? They they have to, since they go into a food product, uh, there shouldn't be any toxins or anything I would think at all, even with the the composite ones which they stick together now to make. Okay, that's it for questions. Uh, next week zooms on really great topic green gardens and we'll have the ad out and the sign up for that soon that was really great jeff i learned a lot and a lot of things as i always do from your talks anybody else have any more questions we had one last question about the youtube site and the follow-up email um we'll send that link out by friday here i'll post it one more time that's the general website but the specific site for this this class will will send out on Friday. Yes, and we'll have it on Facebook too. Thanks everybody. Thanks Jeff. Yes, thank you. Unfortunately, back to work, but <laughs> thank you very much. Hope to see everybody next week. Bye. Thank you, Jeff. If you're interested in lawn care, please contact our best lawns coordinator, Natalie Walker at nwalker at pwcgov.org. If you enjoyed this video, please let us know with your questions, comments, and suggestions for other classes and videos. We can be reached at mastergardener at pwcgov.org. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.